Baptist Church live stream for April 19th, first Sunday after Easter. And as usual, if you want to sing along at home, the words will be on the screen. Please join us with us in worship. this uh, city and uh, in some cases across the state and across some cases across the United States and so we want to welcome you this morning and remember uh, as we worship the Lord today uh, on this Lord's Day um, that uh, we are here to allow him to to change our hearts to 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 allow the worship of him to allow his word to change us and to mold us and to make us more like him and and uh, so with that in mind we will open up uh, with a word of prayer. So would you bow your hearts in prayer with me this morning? Lord, we want to come before you. We realize that what we're doing this morning is not entertainment. Lord, this is not like, you know, we're trying to, we're not trying to compete with Hollywood. We're not trying to compete with Netflix or Hulu or ABC or NBC or uh, or any other television networks, Father. We're here to worship the one true God. And we don't have all the technologies that, that, that all those big companies have and things, but Father, we have your spirit that you've given us. Holy Spirit, we do pray in Jesus' name that you will make connections that are impossible for us to make. That you will do things through this worship time in us that there's no way that any kind of media could replicate. We're thankful, Father, that we have our phones and we're thankful we have our computers and these kinds of technologies that will allow us to be able to come and meet together this morning. And uh, we thank you for those that are able to join us live. We thank you for those who are able to come a little bit later. But, Father, we want you to be glorified in this. And so we ask this humbly. Change us, mold us, and make us. In Jesus' name, amen.
yesterday and was talking about how God put the lights in the expanse of the sky and I got to thinking about how big that expanse is and so I was really thankful that John this morning led us in that worship song uh, because it was just you know you know God put us he put the sun in place he put the moon in place and the stars and it is so vast and it's so big that we have trouble understanding all of it I mean, right? I mean, we really uh, don't understand all that is out there in the universe. And, and it's really, for him, not a big thing. For him, it's easy. And uh, that's the God that we are worshiping this morning. That's what we want to remember. And uh, so, uh, so we're going to, uh, this is our connection time. Remember, a connection is when we connect with each other, when we connect with our Lord, when we connect with our community. And, um, and so, uh, like John mentioned, you know, so this is the first Sunday um, after Easter, and uh, now there's starting to be talks of, uh, of phasing uh, things back in, and, you know, in, in a few weeks ahead, maybe we'll be meeting together uh, in person, and uh, well, that'll be a blessing. We'll look forward to that, and I know it would be great to worship 
uh, with some of those that, that are not even able to worship with us uh, on, uh, online. Um, but uh, but uh, we're so thankful for this time and this opportunity. We are praying about maybe whether we'll continue this or not. We'll, we'll be talking about that more later. But um, we do want to, uh, just to let you know that, um, that we're praying for you and thinking about you. And so thank you. Uh, thank you. When we talk about connections, when you make the comments there, um, that's connecting, right? You're connecting with us. We may not be able to see them uh, in real time. We may not be able to uh, uh, see them while we're doing this, but we do like to go back and and uh, and see the comments that you made. It uh, lets us know that that we're getting some uh, that you're hearing it and that you're understanding it and. Uh, and, and sometimes we've got some really good um, feedback on, the, you know, getting, making adjustments on all this stuff. So that's really important. So we're thankful for that. And, uh, and another way that we connect is through giving. And so, um, as you know, that uh, during this time when we're not meeting, we're not physically taking up an offering. And so if you are able to, uh, uh, if you are a member of the church and you're able to go ahead and send that check in, and we really appreciate it because our bills are still coming. And uh, so we, we still need to make those, uh, and uh, so if you would please go ahead and send those in. And uh, if you're a guest watching for the first time, uh, just give as you you know, as you pray and you feel led to give, if you feel blessed and you want to give, then uh, we're going to have the uh, address there. You see right there, 211 Green Street, Cumberland, Maryland, 21502. And uh, so we're, uh, we're talking about maybe ways to give electronically, but right now if you could write a check and send it to that, then we'd be appreciative of it. Um, and then uh, <clears throat> we're going to have that address there at the end of the slide as well. And it's also obviously on the Facebook page. And so I want to invite you to participate in that. And, and uh, so now uh, Brother John is going to lead us in a prayer um, for, the, uh, for praying for the coming of God's kingdom. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have chosen to reveal your kingdom to us and that you allow your kingdom to be part of us here. We thank you that you have given us the church, which is how you, your kingdom is expressed here on the earth. I pray for us, Father, as members of your church. Help us to be proper representatives of your kingdom. Help us to be loyal to you efficient in the duties that you give to us, and dependable in every assignment of service that you lead us in. Lord, I want to lift up our local churches. Help us all to live as Christian communities. Strengthen and encourage all of us as we worship you today. Help us to always remember that we're not in competition, but we're merely in different units in your mighty army. Give us a bigger vision to be part of the larger community of joining together in public worship and lifting praise to you. Father, help us to recognize those around us with needs. It's been said that we often don't know the person who's kneeling next to us in the pew. And as we're isolating, open our eyes so that we're not inadvertently being insulated. Help us to love and to care for others as Jesus did. And we ask all this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This is part of that prayer, that God would be glorified in us.
Amen and amen and amen. I love what John said just a minute ago as he was praying it, you know, reminding us in that prayer that um, that churches are not in competition with one another. And um, we are all here. Uh, we're proclaiming the name of Christ. We're, we're all here. We're, Jesus is building his church. There's only one bride, the bride of Christ. The ones who are teaching and, and obeying His Word and trusting in Him, and uh, we may we may not have everything perfect, but He is making us perfect, and we have been made righteous in the by the blood of Jesus. Amen. That's worth that's worth shouting. Amen. So if you're at home, just shout it out, man. Say Amen. Amen. <laughs> and here too. <laughs> and uh, so uh, so now we're going to prepare for worship uh, through the Word. Uh, would you bow your heart with me? Lord, we come this morning, and we know that, Father, it is your word that brings life. It is your word that changes us. It is your word that burns in our heart. It is your word that enlightens us and brings truth to us in a way that, that we could not. When we watch movies, some of them are very dramatic. Some of them are very powerful. And sometimes movies can move us to emotional experiences. I can think of a couple times in the last week, Father, when I cried or just about cried watching something on TV. But there is nothing that moves like you, Holy Spirit. Only you can enlighten us in the truth. Spirit of the living God, we come before you. This is not, we don't have a formula to, to try to, to we, there's nothing that we can, we are completely at your mercy to show us your word, to show us and unveil the truth that has been from the beginning of time. We're just little tiny specks in the whole grand scheme of things. But yet it's for us that you died and rose. So this morning, do what only you can do. Take this worship, the worship in song, the worship in your word. Penetrate our hearts and change us and make us more like Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. So, if I looked at you today, if I was to bump into you on the street, well, we would be six feet apart, right? So I wouldn't bump into you. But if we were to come across each other in the store and I would said to you, these are crazy times, you would know exactly what I was talking about. You see, last year you might have made an assumption about, well, what in the world is he talking about? Is he talking about politics? Is he talking about, you know, the, the, the massive amounts of corruption that's going on in the world? Or is he talking about um, the, the major blessings that we've been getting? You know, is he, what is he talking about? But if I say, like, right now, these are crazy times, there's no question in your mind what I'm talking about. We're all going through an experience that is in a unique way pulling all of us together or, or, or maybe in some cases might be pushing us apart but, but we're all going through these experiences like for example there's a t-shirt that, uh, that uh, I, I saw being made right it says uh, <clears throat> for some reason that picture is not coming out real clearly but it says I survived the toilet paper roll apocalypse 2020 now, if I would have wore that t-shirt last year, you would have looked at me and said, what? But everybody knows about the toilet paper apocalypse, right? I mean, this is going to be something that probably we'll look back and we'll tell our grandkids. It'll be one of those funny stories about how people raided grocery stores and, and uh, you couldn't find toilet paper and all that kind of stuff. And you know, it'll be something humorous that we'll all look back on. It'll be that the one humorous thing, right, that... 
that'll mark this, uh, certainly go down in the history books. <laughs> you can imagine our grandkids and great grandkids learning about, uh, learning about the great toilet paper apocalypse. Um, but but we, we, the idea is that we, this is an experience that we're all going through together. And so we're all able to talk about it in certain ways, right? I know that um, uh, it doesn't matter where I go, when, when, you know, I, one of the things because of my, uh, the other job where I, you know, drive uh, postal trucks and stuff and then we talk with different people out on the streets or maybe we'll go, uh, you know, the grocery store or whatever and every once in a while we'll bump into people and uh, ev here's what I know is everybody has an opinion about what they think is going on, right? I've read about them. We've talked about them with other people. You can see those opinions on Facebook, right? You can see all over the place. We're seeing everybody talking about this. And, and, and as we get further along, people are getting more concrete in about what they think, right? You get people from, for example, we'll just take, for example, the, the whole idea of, you know, uh, 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 some people say, oh, man, I'm not going to wear any kind of mask or I'm not going to wear gloves or I'm not going to do this thing. Get all the way people all the way on the other extreme saying, man, we got to we got to be where all this time. And, you know, and or, or you get people saying, you know what, this is a you got people always saying this is a ploy, you know, to try to take control all the way to the other side. It's like, ah, is, what are we going to do? You know, how are we going to stop this thing? And, you know, and, and so there's a lot of discussion about these things. And. And people have definitive opinions about what they think is the right answer to all of this. People have definitive opinions, or, or and, there's, and, and then there's also on the other side where people have like no idea how to respond to any of this. But the fact of the matter is, is that we're all going through it. We're all talking about it. And we all have things about it that we talk about. And in some cases, it leads to, to arguing and fussing in some cases, right? I mean, we can see that at, at a national level. We can see that at local levels and, and things like that. But there's a lot of discussion and, and even some arguing going on about it. And so there's when we think in terms of, you know, last week we were talking about the resurrection. And we were talking about how... This very idea or this understanding is, is something that's much bigger than us. And, and if you remember, if you had the chance to watch last week's lesson, we talked about how, how sometimes we perceive things differently than what they really are. And that for us to understand something that's outside of our realm, we need something from outside of our realm to come and explain to us. And that's what Jesus did. And he demonstrated the veracity and the truth of that by the resurrection, as we celebrate, which is what we celebrate for Easter. And then, but then some people want to, to bring up or talk about this question about the resurrection and, and, and what is, what, you know, what is it, is it valid? And here's the thing is that during this time, everyone in that area, during that time in, when Jesus was resurrected from the dead, there was no questions about it. People were talking about it. People had questions. I mean, they, some people remembered the things that Jesus said, but it didn't make sense to them. And, you know, they, even when he resurrected from the dead, there was people who, who didn't, you know, they didn't put the pieces together and understand that he actually did rise from the dead. But the fact is the matter that Jesus remained on this earth for some time, for 40 days, after his resurrection, showing himself to different people. And this was the big topic of the day. There's nobody that would have lived during that time that wouldn't have had heard of something that would have crossed over so many different uh, political lines, religious lines. I mean, it was common knowledge. This was something that people understood. This was something that everybody was talking about during that day, just like we're talking about the coronavirus. And just like people had different opinions about things, people have different, had um, different opinions about the resurrection. And they got into discussions and arguments and things like that. But what it boils down to is what Jesus wanted to demonstrate to people is that the power of the resurrection is that it transforms the lives of those who come into contact with us. 
it with it. It, it. it changes us. And so the main point of today's lesson, I'm not sure really why that's coming out really skewed. That's really strange. Um, so uh, the point is, is that uh, the resurrection, well, that, I, I'm not sure what to do about that. I'll, I'll read that to you. My apologies. It was working just before when we had it all set up. Wasn't it, Abigail? <laughs> it was working. So I don't know. I don't know what happened. This is what would what did John say? Would you call it a gremlin? Gremlin. Yeah, it's a little gremlin. These are one of those technology glitches that happen sometimes. But um, but this is the main point, right? The main point is this: that God has had the same plan from the beginning to change us from the inside out, and the power of the red, and that is the power through the power of the resurrection of Jesus. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. And we're going to be, uh, we're going to be, uh, the title of I've entitled this uh, Transformation Power. And that the whole reason for the resurrection is that it has the power. This is what God, how God, number one, God demonstrated that Jesus is real. And that this is what, listen, the resurrection by itself is the one thing that sets apart Christianity from any other religion in the world. Any other. You see, no other religion, every other religion is all about what we do to try to get to God. But Christianity is what God did to come to us. And the one thing that we know to be true is the fact of the resurrection. And so, we're going to be uh, reading from Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 34. And uh, usually we'll, uh, we'll stand uh, in honor of the reading of God's word as a, a kind of a, a, a way of showing respect. And so if you are at home and you are able to stand, uh, uh, that's that would be wonderful. If you can't, we under, certainly understand that as well. Uh, but uh, So we're going to be in, in, uh, in chapter 24, starting with verse 13. Lord, bless the reading of your word. Now, that same day, two of them were on their way to the village called Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. Together they were discussing everything that had taken place. And while they were discussing and arguing, Jesus himself came near and began to walk along with them. But they were prevented from recognizing him. Then he asked them, what is the dispute that you're having with each other as, as you are walking? And they stopped walking and they looked discouraged. The one named Cleopas answered him, Are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened there in those days? What things, Jesus asked them. So he said to him, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, powerful in action and in speech before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we were hoping that he would be the one who was about to redeem Israel. Besides all of this, it's the third day since things happened. Moreover, some of the women from our group astounded us. They arrived early at the tomb, and when they didn't find his body, they came and reported what they had seen, uh, that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of them were with us and went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they didn't see him. He said to them, How foolish and slow you are to believe that the, that the prophets have spoken. Wasn't it necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and the prophets, he interpreted them for all things concerning himself in the scriptures. They came near to the village where they were going, and gave, he gave the impression that he was going further. But, he urged, but they urged him, stay with us, because it's almost evening, and now the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. It was... It was as he reclined at the table with them that he took the bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, 
but he disappeared from their sight. They said to each other, weren't our hearts burning with, uh, within, and within us while he was talking with us on the road and explaining the scriptures to us? That very hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and those with them gathered and said, The Lord has truly been raised and appeared to Simon. Then they began to describe what happened on the road and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Transform us now. Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much, all of you, for participating in that way. And so, so now here we are. We're going to be uh, looking uh, at this first verse, which is. Uh, I wonder if you just unplug the Apple TV and plug it back in and see if that see if that'll reset it. Um, we're gonna we'll do that. I'll just keep on going, but she's going to reset the Apple TV, so maybe that'll maybe that'll fix it. But. Uh, uh, so there, so here we are. We find ourselves. This is right after the third day. Jesus had risen from the dead, and and uh, so you remember some of those had went to the to the tomb, and Jesus was uh, was not there. The angels said to them, and he was not there, and so there was some some doubt going on still about this. And it says, uh, so now that same day, two of them were on their way to the village called Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. So. They were obviously, you know, they were going about their business just like we are, right? We're, we're going, maybe they're not, uh, maybe they're walking a little bit closer than six feet to each other, right? But nonetheless, they are, um, they are, uh, they're traveling together on the road to Emmaus. And then we look at the next verse and it says that um, together they were discussing everything that was taking place. Now, we have to put it in the context of everything that was going on. Remember, this was right before the Passion Week. Jesus had, he had healed Lazarus, raised him from the dead. He had come into the, uh, to the temple with authority. He had turned over the money ta tables. He was speaking boldly and plainly to all the chief priests and the religious people. And, and, uh, and so this had caused a lot of people go into a lot of extensive discussion about things, right? Just in the same way, like we're, we're always constantly talking about, right? People like, well, what did the president do? Or what did the governor do? Or what did this person do? Or man, did you hear what that person said? And, and so uh, just give me one second here. I'm going to reconnect back and hopefully this is going to fix the problem. And it looks like we might be in good shape. There we go. Praise the Lord. And uh, so thank you for all those praying. And then we'll go away. But since so they were discussing together everything that had taken place, just in the same way that we do, we can imagine this very concept. That this was, a, this was something big that was going on. And this was captivating everybody's attention. If there had been news broadcasts, this would be on the news. This would be like front pages of the New York Times. I mean, this would be like all over the place. And... Uh, and so they were discussing it, and, and uh, Luke goes on and says, and, and while they were discussing and arguing, not, he specifically put this word there, like, they were like intense about this thing, right? There's certainly a lot of interpretation. Like Some people are, are dogmatically arguing about this whole pandemic being, you know, this is the sign of the times, and, and that means Jesus is coming back, and maybe they're even trying to pin a date on it. And listen, Jesus might be coming back. But it's not for us to know the day or the hour. We've talked about that a few weeks ago, about what it means to be prepared. And so that's not what the discussion is today. But, but the fact of the matter is, is that they were discussing things, but they didn't really understand the level that they were discussing things. If you're going back to remember what we talked about last week, that we can't really effectively argue and talk about things that we don't really understand. We can't really, for example, if I, if, uh, if I said I was going to take you to a little country somewhere in South Africa and, and, uh, and I want you to describe that, you go there and you describe it and you talk about it and you come back and you and I were both there together, but nobody else was there, so how would, how would they know about it? Well, they would know about it because we were there and we were able to talk about it in that same way. And so this whole idea about when we talk about the resurrection and the power in life, 
This whole thing was a new concept. People didn't understand. I mean, people don't just raise up from the dead on their own power. That's It's not ever been in human thinking. Just like the whole idea of the virgin birth. This is why people struggle with the idea of the virgin birth. How can someone conceive as a and, and still be a virgin? It doesn't even make, humanly speaking, it doesn't even make sense. And so, so this, this kind of thing, when you start talking about heavenly things, when you start talking about things in the spiritual realm, obviously this opens up a huge door for lots of discussion and even some arguing, right? Am I right? Because there's a lot of things that we just don't know about because we're limited in our understanding and our perceptions, which we talked about last week. But I love this. I, this, is, this shows, the dem this demonstrates the compassion of our Lord. Because it says, while they were doing this, it says what? It says, Jesus himself came near. And, and I love this part. Look at this right here. It's all, this whole idea. <clears throat> it says that Jesus came near. This is something that he can do. Only he's the one that can approach us. He's the one that makes the initiative. This is what we talked about a minute ago, just about the difference between Christianity and every other religion. In true Christianity, when, we, when I refer to Christianity, I'm referring to that Christianity comes from Jesus. It's not a religion of works. But true Christianity, Jesus comes to us. And Jesus came to these people. Right after the resurrection. This was the day he had risen from the dead. And it says he began to walk along with them. This whole idea that he is participating in their life. He's right there and he's walking with them. And look what the next verse it says. But they were prevented from seeing him. Here's what we've got to understand about the spiritual realm. We cannot see or understand the spiritual realm on our own. It is impossible. We cannot understand it unless God does something. And that's what the whole, we see this whole message all throughout scriptures. And, um, but we see the compassion of our Lord in this and that, that he is the one coming to them and there's this reality. You see, a lot of times, Jesus is doing a work in and among us. We can see all of the things that are taking place. Money's getting tighter for some of us. Some of us are, um, uh, maybe some people might be losing jobs. But, but listen, in spite of all that, we have a lot, a lot, a lot to be thankful for. We should, we got to remember, we've got a lot to be thankful for. But yet... Still, even in the midst of this, there's still difficult things going on. And listen, for some of you, the pandemic is not the difficulty. It's the other things that maybe come with it. Or it might, there might be some things that you were already experiencing before that are causing those difficulties. But the reality is, is that, that we cannot always understand what God is doing. That sometimes we're blinded to that, that very thing that he's doing. We just can't see it because we lack the spiritual understanding. Look at verse 17. Then he asked him, he said, What is this dispute that you are having with each other as, uh, while you are walking? Tell me what's going on with you guys. Right? And, and so he kind of comes in and joins in on the conversation. And, uh, and it's that same way for us in, in that idea as we're going through this time of this pandemic, as we're going through this this not only not only is this a citywide thing, not only is this a, a, a statewide or a countrywide thing, this is a global wide thing. And as we are all going through this together and discussions are being aroused, Jesus is coming alongside, right? How is he coming alongside? Well, like maybe right now. Maybe you've maybe you're you know you're watching this and you're listening, and maybe you're a member and you're listening and you're going, man, I never really understood this before, but or maybe uh, maybe you just happen to, to pop in and you're gonna and you're watching and listening. To this and, and, but Jesus is coming alongside because He wants us to see something that we've not seen before, right? And and look at the reaction what they says and they stopped walking. Go, what does that say? You ever have you ever been in a conversation with someone 
Like you're you're walking and then some, somebody says something really radical and you stop and you go like, what? really? Like, I mean, this was how this was how much it impacted them. They're so like that the fact that they're on this this road, they're they're walking to a maze and they're on this destination. It that when Jesus asked this question, it it it, it physically causes them to stop and 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 look and and you know they're like they look really discouraged and luke goes on to describe he says the one named cleopas answered are you the only visitor in jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened in these days right this would be the exact equivalent of of uh if i walked up to you and and and, and i said What's the big deal? What's the problem going on? In our, you know, then you would look at me and say, well, "Well, Pastor, don't you know there's a global pandemic going on? Are you clueless? That's how big that was. This taking everybody knew about this. Everybody knew that this man was crucified. There was a big to do about this thing. Lots of things happened. You remember when?" That even when Jesus died, there was the big earthquake, the tearing of the veil, and so much was happening, and it was causing like a lot of confusion. A lot of people didn't understand those things, and and uh, and so I just got to like really appreciate like Jesus and how gentle he is. With look at he just he said like what things. Like if you if you really are watching, like reading this, and you go, what things? Here's the God of the universe, who had just spent the last three years with these disciples. Some of uh, not, not these his twelve, his eleven, but these are some other disciples who who were always also involved in 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 that. But he had just spent all this time with them, and. Um, had died and had come back from the dead. And, and just as we were talking about last week, this was the God who came from, from heaven. This is the God of life, the God who created all things. And, and uh, he presents himself in this way. He said, what things? You see what he's doing? He's giving them the chance to express what's going on. And see, I think the thing for us is that we have to come to a place in, in our life where we realize you know what's going what's really going on what's what's really happening we need to assess what's going on in our life and listen i believe as i've said before that that one of the things that i believe that god will use this whole pandemic for is to help us to get to the point of start asking the real questions about what we're doing why we're here and what's this purpose and he goes on and he, and he so he says to them this is cleopas talking remember and so now he's going to give a summary of everything that's been going on. He says, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth. Now, he is very specific about the way that he speaks about Jesus of Nazareth. Now, remember the fact that Jesus is, his, even his name being tied to Nazareth, because Nazareth was considered a small town, a small place, like nothing you know, uh, Philip even said, Dick, like nothing good. What good is going to come out of Nazareth? That little small podunk place, right? And uh, but here is now this Jesus who comes from this. But he was a prophet who was powerful in action. That was one of the ways that he describes him, right? And uh, what is what did they saw? They saw him like we mentioned a minute ago. They saw Jesus raised from the dead. They saw that he was. When he, when he believed that there was impurities going on in the, in the temple, he turned over the money tables. And, and uh, he had healed people and took people who were blind and made them see again. People who couldn't walk and allowed them to be able to walk again. And so, so not only was he, uh, but not only was he had this physical ability to do things, but look at the second part. He says, in speech. He was powerful in speech before God and before all the people. That when he spoke, he spoke with authority. He spoke with determination. He spoke as someone who knew what was going on and he was not ashamed. He wasn't inhibited in any way. This is exactly why people were following him. 
You see, he could go stand and speak even to the religious people. And they, they tried to corner him. They tried to trap him, but they couldn't, which is part of what we talked about last week as well. So people thought, this surely is the guy. Because look what he says in verse, verse 20. He says, and how the chief priests and the leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. In other words, guys, don't you realize that there was this guy that was really great, and we thought he was going to be the one. Right? Because we, we think that way, right? We, have, we say, look, we, we, one of the big things in our country, in our culture, in our time, right? We say, man, it's going to be, everything hinges on our next president. He's going to, whoever it is, is going to be the one. And that's exactly what they were thinking. You see, look what he goes on and, and says, but, but now that all this guy that, that spoke with such authority, this guy had done all these miracles, now all of a sudden he's dead. What's up with that? Look what look at, this is this is why they were hanging their head. But we were hoping that he was the one who was about to redeem Israel. Now, when you think about the word redeem there, okay, the word redeem, uh, like true, like true, like true, means to deliver or to rescue from slavery. And so the, the Jews were living under the oppression of the Roman government. And so their thought was, we've got to be set free. And, and as human beings, we're, we always are finding ourselves subjected in some way, right? Listen, sometimes, I hear this in discussions all the time. We talk about in some ways how we're enslaved to our own government. We're blessed. We are really blessed as a nation in the kind of government that we have. We're not enslaved in, in ways like, like the Jews would have been in, 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 in the Roman Empire. But we're always, we're all slaves in some way into something. But we'll talk about that later. But, but, he says, but he says, we were hoping that Jesus was going to be the one that was going to take us out of this Roman slavery. And he says, so, and that didn't happen. And besides all of that, it's the third day since these things have happened. He talked about being risen from the dead, and now here it is, three days, time has passed on. Nothing big has happened. Nothing, there's no huge, you know, sparkling fireworks, no armies have been raised. There's, here it is. What's this big revolution that was supposed to take place on the third day? And then to boot, look what he goes on. He says, and moreover, we'd say down south, we'd say to boot, right? So in, in the cotton patch version, it would say, to boot, some of the women, right? But moreover, some of the women from our group astounded us. They arrived early at the tomb, and they, when they didn't find his body, they came and reported that they had seen the vision of angels who said he was alive. So you would think that this would be the thing that would trigger the people to start going, yay, he's alive, he's risen. But you remember, they were being blinded to the truth about who Jesus is. They couldn't see, they couldn't understand. And you see, there's, we have to remember, in the midst of everything that is going on, we gotta remember what we talked about last week, our perceptions are skewed. We don't see and know everything that's going on. But what God is trying to do is to use this as a way for us to spark us to begin to come to this place where we might start listening to him. Because look, it goes on in verse 24. It says, some of them, some of those who were filled with us, I mean, excuse me, some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women said, but they didn't see him. So, so some people, some people were going, and and they, they didn't see this. So there's there's still this, <coughs> excuse me, there's still this doubt. That's a dry cough. That's not you don't have to worry about. That's <coughs> dry from preaching <coughs> or teaching. So uh, <coughs> actually, you guys don't have to worry about it anyway, right? It's not going to come through the phone. I guarantee it. <laughs> but uh, so there's this whole doubt that's running through their mind. That listen, even though Jesus said that he would rise again. 
people still doubt it. Because that's just not something that happens. That is no different today. You might be watching and you might be under the hearing of my voice and you might have your doubts as well. You might be listening going, yeah, I, I just don't see how that could happen. Listen, you're not the first and you won't be the last. Even during that day, people doubted. But what Jesus says next, or what Jesus does next, will give us some incredible insight into what is going on. Look what Jesus says. He said to them, How foolish are you and slow to believe all that the prophets had spoken? <clears throat> In other words, he's saying to them, God has been speaking from the beginning of time about what his plan is. God, from the very beginning, all the way back, when we, you know, even in the Garden of Eden, when God promised Adam and Eve he was going to send a deliverer. He promised Moses, Abraham, he promised Moses, he prayed all of the patriarchs to go back all throughout, over and over, God has promised that he was going to make right what we messed up. That God was going to send a deliverer that was going to do this very thing. And Jesus is that deliverer. And what he's saying is, is listen, you, you guys, like, the scripture has been prophesying about me coming and dying, resurrecting. And now, you know, even I said it, and now, you know, you're not even believing. This is how, how foolish are you and slow to believe. Listen, the reality is that we have to realize that <clears throat> what Jesus is saying, if we are not if we don't understand that who Jesus is, it is foolish. It's, it's, we don't, because we're not grasping the truth. He says, he goes on, wasn't it necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and enter into his glories? In other words, he's saying, listen, the bottom line is this, guys. Is it, he's saying, it, Jesus, the Messiah, had to come. And he, he like referring to him in the third person, right? He said, the, the Messiah. He had to suffer these things. Why? Because the Messiah wasn't coming to build a kingdom on this earth. If you remember, John was praying about that earlier, right? That Jesus was coming to build a kingdom of hearts. A kingdom or a nation of people who believe and trust in his word. But in order for that to happen, there has to be a payment for the penalty of our sin, right? Because we've offended God. We've, we've, we have come with our own pride and our own arrogance and, we, and not trusting Him. And so what is the result? The result is, is that, that we, it puts up a roadblock between us and Him. And that because He is a just God, because He's a God that is going to make things right, there has to be a punishment for that. But His love is so much even greater that what He did was He sent His own Son to come and die. So that we don't have to. And he demonstrated his power and purity over life by coming up out of the grave. And he, and, and, but he goes, not, it's not only, but listen, it's not just the fact that, that he suffered those things. It's the second part. It says he entered in his glory. The fact that Jesus was able to come back and go back to the position of being with his father. That's where the power comes from. When we come to the place where we understand that, that is the transformation. That's what makes true Christianity true Christianity. But he's very specific about the way he does it. He says, then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted them for them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. In other words, he's going back and he's saying, guys, from the beginning, this is what God intended. And probably in that conversation, I probably am certain in that conversation, he included the whole conversation about the whole topic of the Passover and why Passover had come. And, and that the reason that God had, the Jews celebrate Passover, and you remember, if you, maybe you're not familiar with Passover, but that was um, when God was sending the plague of the firstborn. They were to take the lamb and they were going to sacrifice the lamb. And then they took the blood of the lamb and they painted it on the doorposts of the house. So when the death angel came by, if the blood of the lamb was painted on the doorpost, he would pass over and they wouldn't be, that house would not be affected. 
they were putting their trust in the sacrifice, the blood sacrifice. And what Jesus was saying, listen, that was pointing to the very thing that Jesus had just done. He had just sacrificed himself as the Passover, the one true Passover lamb that was going to cause the forgiveness of sins for all, all man and for all time. Right? And then it says, as they neared the village where he was going... Uh, he gave the impression that he was going on farther. Well, whatever, you know, there's this idea that, uh, you know, he maybe was testing to see where did, were they being responsive to his word. Listen, it, and it might be that, that you're, you know, maybe you're right here and you're listening and there's something going on. Look what, look what happens. It says in verse 29, it says, They urged him, stay with us, because it's almost evening and now the day is almost over. So he went in and stayed with them. They asked him, listen, we, we've been listening to your teaching. We've been hearing what you're saying. We want to hear more. We don't want you to leave. And, and, and if you're feeling that this morning, maybe you're, there's something tugging at your heart. You're going, I want to know just a little bit more. I want, to, I want to hear just a little bit more. This is the Messiah. This is God working in you. He's doing something in your life. And, uh, and, he's, and this is the idea right here when we look at it. It says, he, so he, he went to stay with, he went in to stay with them. This goes back to what Jesus, at first, what did he do? He drew near to them, right? And now they said, hey, listen, we want more. And so he stays with them. If you, this morning, are feeling that in your heart, you should say, God, stay with me. As we're going through this pandemic, stay with me. As we're going through this time of uncertainty, Lord, I, I want, I want uh, some of that teaching. I want, to, to, I want some of that assurity. I want to know that you're in control. I want to have that confidence and begin to listen and hear. Because our Lord is an intimate and passionate God. And he loves us intimately. And the next thing he does is he does something incredibly intimate with people. One of the most intimate things that we do as people is we eat and we feast together. Look what happens. He says, it was as he reclined at the table with them, he took the bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. What does this look like? This looks like the meal that he just had with them less than a week ago in Passover. That now they are they are experiencing the intimate fellowship of the Lord in the context of the meal, and that He's doing that very same thing. That the idea of being reclined at the table, right? That's not something that we do. Sometimes in our culture, we say, you know, you're reclining at the table. We we might take it as an insult, maybe, but in a lot of cultures in the world, you're reclined at the table. You're actually laying back. You've got your feet. You know, throw it back a little bit, and you got a pillow, and you're reclining. You're you're actually there, and you're there for a long time. But during that time, then he took the bread and he blessed it and prayed, and then he broke it. Right again, being that symbol of his broken body, and something in that precious moment. Look what happened in verse uh, thirty-one. It says their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. You see something different. Had happened. Now they finally understood who Jesus was. They understood the Messiah. Now, what's interesting about Jesus, right? He could have risen from the dead. We, we all heard the stories about, well, while he was on the cross, you know, he could have called angels down and they could have taken him off the cross, and, but he didn't. You know, and the other side of the story is, is afterwards, he could have come back in a blaze of glory. He could have come back and filled the skies with thunder and all that kind of stuff, but he doesn't. How does he come back? He comes back in these small and gentle ways. Because, listen, his desire is he's not coming to knock us over and to try to, you know, tell us what kind of idiots we are or things like that. He's coming to say, listen, my message for you has always been the same. I have come and I've demonstrated my love and I'm coming to give you a way out of the trouble that, we're, that you're in. 
And see, finally, at that moment, they recognized that he was, he was not the Messiah that was going to deliver them from the slavery of the Egyptians. He was delivering them from the, I mean, not the Egyptians, the, uh, the Romans. He was coming to deliver us from the slavery of our own sin. Because, you see, what the Word of God teaches us is that we're slaves to sin. That we can't even, we can't even do good things because we're involved, because everything is tainted. Our motives are tainted. Our desires are tainted. Listen, we say, well, I'm going to go out and I'm going to do good things because, you know, because it makes me feel good. We're, again, our motive is because we're doing it for us. But Jesus comes and he completely changes our motives and our desires and our compassions and everything. And these guys, now for the first time, they begin to see that and they recognize that he was indeed the one Messiah. But it wasn't what they thought. And you see, you may be thinking as we go through all this, you may be thinking there's a particular outcome. But most likely, it's probably not what you or I thought. And what Jesus is trying to do, he's saying, I want to come alongside of you right now. And I want you to see me for who I am. But this is a supernatural look. It says, they their eyes were opened. They didn't open their eyes. It was the Word of God, the Holy Spirit, who opened up their eyes. It was the truth. You see, this happened in the disciples when they were with Jesus. And they say, right, who is, who do you say that I am? All people, or people say, who do people say I am? Ah, oh, you're John the Baptist, Elijah, and all this. But Jesus looks at his disciples and said, who do you say that I am? And you remember what Peter said, right? He said, you are the Christ, the Messiah. And he said, Peter, Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. For us to understand who the Messiah is, that is something that God is doing and only He is doing. Paul, Peter put, I mean, uh, Paul put it this way. He says, right, he says, um, he says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who wills in you. What is he saying when he says that? He's saying, listen, look at into your heart. Is there a trembling? Is there a wrestling that's taking place in your heart as far as understanding who the Messiah is and what exactly is he trying to do? Because that is the evidence of what God is doing in you. Listen, if you say, Man, I got this. Look, I'm a good person. I, I, I pretty much do good things. You know, I, I listen, then you then you're not wrestling. You're not struggling. You're not coming to, to, you haven't seen yet. Your eyes have not been opened to the spiritual truth and understanding of who Jesus Christ is. Because when that happens, there's a change that happens in us. And that's what happened with these guys. There was a transformation that took place in their life. Look, at, look what happens to them in verse 32. They said to each other, weren't our hearts burning within us? While we were talking, while he was talking with us on the road and explaining the scriptures to us, there was something they realized. Listen, and they didn't even know at that time. And it's, you might be at this point, you're listening, and you're and something's burning in your heart. You're going, "Listen, I'm not really, I'm not completely understanding exactly what you're saying, but there's something that's happening in my heart." I remember going through that, right? I remember when I was a uh, when I was young, I was a religious kid when I was young, right? Going to the, I was an altar boy, going to the altar, but I didn't understand about my relationship with Christ. I didn't understand about my sin. And I didn't understand that I had to confess that sin and give that and trust Jesus Christ. But I remember sitting there at, at, at the Veterans Hospital. I was working at the Veterans Hospital. And I remember a friend of mine named Joseph Fletcher talking to me. And the way he talked about Jesus was like he was alive and it burned in me. And I thought, this, this, this guy is saying some things that I had not really, I had heard the words before, but they weren't burning in my heart. They weren't changing. Something was different this time. He was talking about Jesus as if he was alive and that planted a seed that led me to coming to the place where I finally understood who Jesus was and that he was the Messiah. And it came how? It came through the, the teachings and the explaining of the scriptures. You see, it's the word, the, what are the scriptures? The word of God 
has been God's revelation about himself from the beginning of time. And we want to say, you know, we want to explain it away. Ah, oh, it's a Bible. It's got full of errors and things like that. There's a but listen, there's not. Jesus came and demonstrated over and over and over, and by his resurrection, he demonstrates the veracity, the truthfulness of his word. He came and fulfilled over 300 prophecies that were made about him in the Old Testament. He came and fulfilled in his lifetime. There are more prophecies that have been made and more prophecies about him that are going to come true that have not yet come true. For example, his second coming, when he does come back this time, this, this next time it is going to be in a blaze of glory. It's not going to be on a, in, in a donkey or he's not going to come just walking alongside the road. He's going to come in judgment. And the only way that we can be ready for that is by having trusted in his plan as the Messiah, as the one who came to set us free from the slavery of our own sin. You see, and that comes through the teaching of his word. Look at the next verse. He says, in that very hour, they got up. You see, it, this is what happened. They were, remember, they were on the road to Emmaus. But something sparked in them. Now something had changed. And I want you to look at some of these verbs, right? That very hour, they what? First thing they did, they got up. Now they were motivated at that time, at that moment. And they returned to Jerusalem. They changed their plans. They were, remember, they, were, they had left Jerusalem and they were heading to Emmaus. Now, Jesus came into their life. They've turned 180 degrees. Now they're doing what? They're heading back towards Jerusalem. But here's why. Here's why. They found the 11. Who's the 11? The 11 is the, the, the original 12, the, of the, well, Judas betrayed and he was gone. Out. So it's the 11 disciples that were with them and they were gathered together. They, they went back to them. These are the original teachers. And they said, The Lord has truly been raised and appeared to Simon. They're proclaiming the truth. We know this has happened. We saw him. Look at what they said. They began to describe what happened on the road. They start talking to, about the transformation, about the things that had happened in their life. You see, when I became a follower of Jesus Christ, and when he had made a radical transformation in my life, I couldn't stop talking about it. I wanted to go back and tell other people, listen, look what Jesus did. And it says, so they, they began to talk about, hey, this is what happened in our life. You see, they one minute they're heading to Emmaus and they're discouraged. Now they're turning around and they're heading back to Jerusalem and they're saying, guys, we can't wait. We got to tell you what happened to us. And, and, and look at this, this is important for us. They're telling what happened to them. You see, this, is, this phrase right here is so, so important for us to understand because if we understand true Christianity, true Christianity is not something that we do. True Christianity is something that happens to us. True Christianity is something that God does to us. It changes us to the point now where we can't not talk about it. We want to go talk about it. And they can look at the second part of the verse. Not only did we talk about what, but how he, had, how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Guys, he sat with you guys that night. You know, you guys told us about that night when he broke bread with you guys. And he came and he broke bread with us. And when we understand, listen, there's coming a time when we are going to look forward to sitting around the table and breaking bread with our Messiah. But that breaking of the bread resembled Jesus breaking himself for us. And when we come to the place where we recognize that Jesus broke his body for us so that we can have the forgiveness of sins and now we can experience what Jesus really came to do was to redeem us, not from a government, not from a president, not from a king, not from a form of democracy or dictatorship. Jesus came to set us free from our own sin. That was what they were excited about. That was what they finally came to understand. And maybe here, listen, if you're here this morning and you're already 
and you're already a follower of Jesus Christ, then I pray that you have been encouraged and strengthened in your walk and in your understanding. That you leave with a heart of greater rejoicing that you and I have been able to see. And that even as we go through the midst of this pandemic, as we go through all these things that are difficult and trying, that we are now able to celebrate even more rejoicing because we know there's coming a day when there's not going to be these kinds of things. Because we're, we're basing our faith on the credibility of a God who has kept his word for millennia. And he's not changed. But you might be in another group. Maybe you're listening today. And you might be, you might be like, you might be like the disciples who were walking on that road that day. And there's a burden in your heart. And you might be thinking to yourself, I you know what? I, I'm hearing what you're saying, Pastor Keith. Maybe I'm not understanding all of it. But I want to understand. Call out to him. I want to, this morning, lead you in a, a little prayer. And if you want, while you're home, you can pray this prayer. Lord, I, I know that I'm a sinner. And I know that if I was to stand before you right now, that there would be a lot of things that I would be ashamed of. And I don't understand all, maybe, of what Pastor Keith was talking about. But I do know that Jesus loves me. And I want him to be my redeemer today. Jesus, I confess my sin. And I give my life to you as my Savior. In Jesus' name. John's going to lead us in a song of worship.
See, that's what happened in the hearts of those disciples that day, in Cleopas and the other who was there, and, and, and Mary, and his mother Mary, and all the disciples. You see, that's exactly what they what was the transformation that took place. They were ready to do his will. We love you guys. Thank you so much for coming and participating with us today. Uh, thank you for those of you who are participating live and for those of you that will be coming back later. Um, we thank you so much for that. It does mean a lot um, to us to be able to share in this time with you. And So uh, if it's okay, I'd like to just close. Uh, I want to close in a special prayer for you, but I also want to pray specifically for our, our church members, especially the ones that cannot be here or who are not able to participate with us live. Lord, we come this morning, and I come with thankfulness, Father, for the opportunity to worship with my friends virtually. It's, it's definitely different than coming together live. Definitely. But I'm thankful we can do it. And Father, in the absence of my brothers and sisters in this room together, makes me long even more for that time. And in particular, for those who, who cannot be here because, you know, they just don't, they don't have internet access and, you know, and, and, but looking forward to that time when you will rekindle in us a love for one another and a love for you. Most of all, Father, we love you. The more we love you, Father, the more we love each other. So, Father, we, we, we yearn for that time. We're looking forward to that time with anticipation. And we ask this humbly in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much. God bless. Thank you.